know. Others and my children make smart choices. In college, as an orientation leader, I would tell the incoming freshmen, don't be stupid. I mean, how does a person, though, if you think about it, make a smart choice? I mean, there's a whole industry of books, articles, and helpful resources to help us not make bad decisions. We depend on our friends, our morals, and our faith to help guide us. We learn to not make decisions when we are hungry, tired, or in need of a vacation. We even look back at what we learned in kindergarten to help keep our decisions simple and on the correct path. When we make smart choices, we are willing to try several drafts and options. We put in place backup plans. We find designated drivers, financial, planner, or financial planners, and life coaches. We seek out coupons jobs, and high-quality vehicles. We put on helmets. We hire lawyers. We even pray. All of these we do to find ways to make smart choices through this life. We do what we can to get ahead and not fall behind. We do not ever want to get in a position that makes us feel stupid or look too uncomfortable. We want to do just enough to stay in the race of life, but nothing that makes too much risk. Play life smart. Make smart choices. Don't be stupid. Don't wait too long or don't jump in too early. Don't talk too much, but don't stay too silent. Because people will judge our choices. They judge our character based on our choices. Our choices end up to reflect whether we are smart, daring, good, or bad. In fact, there are a lot of nuances on how people may interpret our choices, our stories. And then all of a sudden we find ourselves changing how we approach our lives based on others' interpretations and understanding of the choices that we have made. You'll find that as a Broadway buff, I will have lots of references to musical theater in my sermons. And recently, the musical Hamilton won the Tony Award for the best Broadway musical. The story is based around the U.S. founding father, Alexander Hamilton. And one of the questions that the show continues to present is who lives, who dies, who tells your story? The character of Aaron Burr, the man who shot and killed Hamilton, sings about how he is painted in history as the villain because he won the duel that killed Hamilton. One shot, one moment, one thing to find his story. Many, including me, sometimes live in this fear that our character, our reputation, our story that we try to live out as good and faithful people will be torn apart in one moment, one decision, one wrong step. It is the same when somebody says one negative comment that erases all the other positive things that have happened in our lives. And then there are others who do the exact opposite who are seeking that one moment that will redeem their stories. The quick fix, like the hula hoop, that makes millions of dollars so that you all of a sudden have in a simple way enough money and power to push away the negative responses. But here's the thing. When we look at one moment, one part of the story, one slogan or response, we are limiting the complexities of the world we live in and the people who live in it. You see, this week there have been many reminders very close to home about how difficult it can be to truly love one another. There are slogans everywhere, Black Lives Matter, Blue Lives Matter, All Lives Matter, and these while our important statements to be made are all just entry points to a much larger and important conversation. And it is through that larger and important conversation that reminds us that God wants us to be in community again and again with one another. And they're not just conversations that should happen in one sermon or one time or around one, one table. They are conversations that we are constantly, as the church, called to respond to beyond just one week. Because 
There are ongoing realities, ones that make our news and don't make our news, along with many other moments that we as people of faith must engage in to help ourselves grow, live, and love into God's call for us. And we are called to be a part in the study of the world that we live in because it is part of our story and all its complexities. It is the same way that we are called to study Scripture. Just in case you've forgotten over the past few weeks while I've been gone, reading Scripture can change our lives. Studying Scripture can change the world. So what are the interesting parts of today's Scripture that will help us look at the current world situation that we are living in. Once again, it's important to note that today's scripture is not found in the usual rotation from which many preachers preach. And I had to wonder why this one didn't quite make the cut. But I think it's because it really doesn't paint Abraham and Sarah in the best way. If they were running currently for political office, this would be the campaign and slogan that opposing candidates would use in their ad campaign to show that they weren't quite as perfect as we make Abraham and Sarah out to be. And at the same time, if we look at the choices made by Abram and Lot, they made smart choices. That's the question that haunts me about this scripture. What do we do when there have been smart choices made, but they're still wrong? Abram makes a smart choice in responding to the tough situation in Egypt. We see that the smart choice is not the right choice, but the smart choice advances his status in the world. The smart choice puts him in a position to have access to Pharaoh and the powers of the world, and yet once again, his smart choice is wrong. Lot also, in the next chapter, makes a smart choice. If you look at the front of your bulletin of the area of the Promised Land, Canaan, you can see where it's kind of put right there next to the mountains. Lot actually chooses to live a little bit closer to the Mediterranean Sea. He lives in the, in the area which is less mountainous. A much smarter choice for people who have to live off the land. He chose the area that made sense. It's closer to water and easier to live. Canaan, the promised land, isn't quite the easiest place to reside and to grow crops. You see, this is my struggle with these two stories again. Smart, smart choices, but somehow deemed wrong. So next week, when we do our Bible study worship, we'll spend a little more time with the long and complex stories of Abraham, Sarah, and those who play important roles, because we will see again and again there is a pattern that the smart choices of the world do not always seem to be God's choices. And so then we have to ask ourselves, what do we learn from today's scripture? Do we learn to make dumb choices? Hmm. Well, I don't think that is quite the point. I do think there might be something to that idea. You see, sometimes I feel like we live in a world where we get so hung up on making the smart choice that we don't make the right choice. You see that all the time with people who are trying to always make sure they have enough money and get financial ends to meet, and all of a sudden they get to the end of their life and they wish they had spent more time with their family or they weren't as focused on stuff but on the people around them. Or I find myself even afraid to take certain risks because I'm too tired to deal with what might cause others to talk behind my back. I, I'm trying to make smart choices, but that doesn't always mean it's the right choice or the choice that God is calling me to make. Because we have to remind ourselves that smart choices are not always balanced choices and not always faithful choices. But dumb choices are not always balanced and faithful either. So as we look at this scripture, there are two things I think that can really help us connect in today's world to understand not the smart choice or the dumb choice, but maybe some of the ways to approach all of this as the faithful choice. They remind us, this story reminds us there is always tough parts in life. There are always famines, 
and hardships again and again. As a world that probably could see itself living in a time of famine, we need to read these stories of the past to know how to be a part of the journey. We also must learn about Canaan and the Promised Land. Sometimes we imagine the Promised Land as a place where the story ends. We forget, actually, that it is also a place where the story and the journey begins. And that it's not always a place filled with milk and honey, but it's actually a challenging place to be a part of. And not only that, but even if we're there, we may be asked by God to go on a different journey that separates us from home. And you may not get to stay in the promised land. And you may even have to leave just because at some point you need to journey to find your way back. You find your way back because it is home. And thus ultimately everyone is on a journey to find their way back to the home where we are most connected with God place where everyone can be fed when there is no famine happening. Second, if Abraham and Sarah, the chosen ones, the founders of all sorts of religious groups and organizations, the ones that we all turn and connect and look to, could screw up, so can we. Everyone can screw up because most of the time it's important to remind ourselves that our narratives in our lives are not based on just one moment or one decision. That is very rare. But those who limit someone's story, like even Aaron Burr's in history, have simplified lives and stories that should not be simplified by one act, one moment, one catchphrase, or one scripture. That we all live lives with dumb choices, smart choices, and our goal is to be with God, and God luckily sticks with us through this. You see, just like us, Abraham, Sarah, Lot, and his family were on a journey that included God, who journeyed with them in both good and bad times. God was there in the famine. When God was there, as they sought ways to find peace. God was there when they journeyed together. And God is here as we continue to journey together. Because there will continue to be in this place, as there should be, difficult discussions. Because we live in a tough world, we are totally in a time of struggle and famine, and it is hard for everyone or anyone to know what smart choices will actually bring peace and truth and a way for everyone to find a home in the promised land. But let us not forget that God has not left us, and God is with us through our choices. And ultimately, just like Abraham's story, we may end up where we started. But as we continue to live, we are called to go out so that we can come back home. Be with God. God who has never left us. God who is always the smart choice, the faithful choice, the right choice. And sometimes God even looks like the dumb choice. But the great thing is God is with us in all of our choices on this journey of life. Let us remember that as we look at a world who needs to know that God is there.